Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Narrator podcast. I am your host Kaivalya Apte and I am back with another episode. Today we are going to talk about a very interesting concept when it comes to distributed systems and, and it's about durable promises, durable async await. And to discuss that with me, I have Dominic Tornow from uh, Resonate, who is the founder and CEO of Resonate. And uh, he used to work at Temporal and he has a vast experience as a distributed systems engineer. So I'm really excited for this episode. So welcome, Dominic, and thanks a lot for joining us today. Why don't you start with a little bit of introduction? Hey, thank you very much for having me. I'm equally excited about this episode. So yeah, I'm uh, Dominic Torno. So uh, professionally, I started at uh, SAP. I stayed with uh, SAP for uh, many years, uh, 11 years here in uh, California and the Bay Area. And I joined SAP in uh, 2008. And if we ignore the financial crisis, big ask, but if we ignore the financial crisis of 2008, it was a great year to get started. And the cloud was in its infancy. The uh, AWS uh, just started. I believe the first cloud service, AWS S3, was uh, published in uh, 2006. Then just around the corner in 2007, there was uh, Heroku. Uh, still my gold standard of an, a fantastic operational experience. And uh, so you can say professionally, I grew up in uh, lockstep with the cloud. And uh, if you grow up with the cloud, you basically grow up with uh, distributed systems. So for uh, my entire career, I was very interested in uh, distributed systems and uh, was very fortunate to work on distributed systems and get to know distributed systems. Uh, from the very beginning at SAP. Then I joined Cisco, as you mentioned. Then I joined uh, Tempora. And uh, just recently, uh, half a year ago, I uh, founded uh, Resonate, also to work on distributed systems with a delightful developer experience. Awesome. Uh, I forgot to mention about your book, uh, Thinking in Distributed Systems. And I've been following following you on Twitter and, you know, about uh, everything you write about distributed systems is just insightful. So thanks for doing that. And for our viewers, if you're not following Dominic, please do. If you're interested in uh, distributed systems and you will learn a lot just by, you know, uh, reading his tweets. No, thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, as I said earlier, we are going to talk about uh, durable async await and we'll come to the distributed part uh, in a bit. Uh, but for our viewers, I want to start very basic here, right? Uh, to define the problem statement and to define the problem domain. So let's start with async await first, right? Like mm -hmm. this programming model, it's been quite, uh, you know, popular. And uh, we have been coding in this uh, async await model for, for a long time now. Uh, so why this model and what, uh, you know, what are the current problems with this model? Let's start from there. So um, async await, if we uh, look at async await, it's one particular model to um, address uh, concurrency. Of course, there are other models, right, that address concurrency, like, uh, for example, um, basic threading, right, addresses concurrency, uh, Golang with uh, channels, uh, or with uh, Go routines and channels, they also address concurrency. So um, uh, async await is one particular model to address uh, concurrency. But um, so what I think makes async await uh, stand out is this uh, very like, straightforward, very tangible mental model. So at the at the uh, beginning of time in in uh, uh, software systems or computer systems, right? We had um, a very uh, simple but very powerful abstraction, and that was functions. McCarthy's paper from 1960, right, introduced the concept of functions and how functions can recursively call other functions. So it was a very simple but universal building block and even the largest systems could be composed from this one building block. So if you understood 
functions and functions calling other functions, right? You already understood um, the, the, the entirety of the abstraction. Right? And that to me is, is a very, very powerful, um, very powerful concept that we can build the largest systems, even from the, from the smallest building blocks. So, but at that time, we were all dealing with uh, sequential computation, right? And um, concurrency was introduced uh, sometimes later. Now, concurrency introduced new challenges, right? So in concurrency, you can argue that moving from sequential computation to um, um, concurrent computation, you're basically introducing uh, non-determinism into the system, right? So now you can take step A uh, before step B or step B before step A. And um, now with that, we need uh, coordination, right? Because uh, now different uh, function executions, if they run uh, concurrently, they need to coordinate to be composed into uh, coherent systems. Now, if we look at, for example, JavaScript, it's a really fantastic, uh, like, um, Example, if you want to follow that history, right? In, in JavaScript, we did uh, the callback style, right? So where it's like uh, one function uh, registered a task and then also registered the, the callback that shall be called uh, when, that, when that task finished. And that was before async await. So it's, and now if you, if you look at that, that's actually like fairly difficult to follow, right? And that is what eventually became known as the callback hell. And uh, if you have like difficult, uh, complex control flow, right? If, uh, if then else loops, uh, try catch blocks, that becomes really, really difficult to follow. And uh, why I am so smitten by async await is um, async await transforms a sequentially looking code into asynchronous computation, I'm sorry, into concurrent computation. And that is just an amazing feat. It makes reasoning about the code, even though that the underlying control flow is very complex, makes reasoning about the code very straightforward. So that is why I was so smitten or why I am so smitten by the um, async await uh, model. And uh, when we come um, to, to uh, concurrent computation, right? Async await uh, does, a, does a fantastic job. It is syntax sugar on top of uh, functions and promises. Now, functions were introduced in the 60s, and then uh, promises uh, followed hot on their heels. They were introduced in the, in the 70s. And uh, a promise is just a representation of a future value. And uh, it's a universal model of uh, coordination. Functions are the universal model of execution and uh, promises are the universal model of coordination, right? If you, need to, um, if you need the result of something, right? You await the promise and the promise is the representation of that future value. So uh, your um, function, the caller can coordinate with the callee on the promise. And async await is the syntax sugar on top of that that uh, gives you this, uh, this uh, sequential uh, looking code. And you can argue the sequential user experience. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, so I, I come from a JVM background. I don't have a lot of JavaScript experience. Uh, but I think I totally agree with the way, you know, if you're able to write asynchronous code in a sequential manner, it's such a simple uh, way to do that. And it gives you, it takes away some mental load uh, from the programmer that you're writing. Uh, you're not going to end up in this callback hell or you know, you're know you not writing, uh, keeping this in mind, oh, this is asynchronous code and I have to you know process it in a different way. But you're writing asynchronous code as if you're writing really sequential synchronous code. I think that that is really powerful. And talking about Scala, for example, it gives you these uh, four comprehensions where you can, you know, it's again syntactic sugars on top of flat maps and whatnot. 
uh, similar to I was uh, recently learning Kotlin coroutines and the way they work, you know, with these suspend functions. And, you know, it was so easy for me as a developer to, you know, write code that is asynchronous, uh, concurrent code, but still uh, not having that mental load mm -hmm. of writing really complicated code, right? So I totally uh, agree on that uh, front. And uh, that's a great point, like starting with a very simple programming model and then extending it uh, mm -hmm. as you also mentioned in your blog. Uh, so what what are the problems there? Like, of course, it's, it's the typical problem when you're calling a function, it might fail, it might give you, a, you know, an um, unexpected response, for example. So when does this durability of uh, async await comes into picture in, in, in the traditional async await uh, programming paradigm? So, um, async await did a fantastic job to elevate concurrency to a first class citizen. I can spend hundreds or thousands of tasks and then uh, await uh, uh, all of these tasks, the completion of all of these tasks in a few lines of source code. In a few lines of source code that are very, very easy, very straightforward to reason about, very easy to understand. But uh, ASIC await wasn't designed with um, distribution in mind. It was mm -hmm. designed with concurrency in mind. And, uh, you know, if we want to follow a very simple, very simple uh, mental model, oversimplified, but it helps to reason about the space. That is, first, we moved from the sequential world into the concurrent world. And that added non-determinism and uh, that added the need to address non-determinism that added the need for coordination right? if we now say we move from the concurrent world to the distributed concurrent world that adds additional challenges one of those is that you already mentioned is for example partial failure right instead of now the entire system take, taking a step forward or the entire system simply halting or crashing Parts of the system may take a step forward, while other parts of the system may not take a step forward. And async await made it possible for us to address concurrency on a, um, a platform level, right? Making it uh, transparent uh, or semi transparent on an application level. Right? But it did not do the same to distribution. It did not the same to distributed system because it wasn't built with distribution in mind. So now um, Resonate is uh, extending the traditional async await programming model to a distributed async uh, await uh, programming model. So we are um, elevating distributed systems to a uh, first class abstraction to a first class citizen in this programming model, pushing more of the complexities that you have to deal with in distributed systems, uh, again, from the application level to the um, platform level. Okay, interesting. Uh, I want to take an example here, right? Like just to uh, give it a more practical touch. Uh, so, for example, like I, I, I typically end up taking e-commerce example because it's so common and I've, I've worked in e-commerce domain, so it's also easier for me. So the order processing system, for example, right, it's pretty mm -hmm. standard. Like you place an order, there's different steps that happens once, like after you've placed the order, right? Mm -hmm. So you've placed the order, you, uh, let's say you do some fraud detection, you create like a shipment order and then, uh, you know, of course, payment is there. And then once it's all done, you, uh, you know, notify uh, the, the customer that, okay, it was done. You get an email or something. So there are like different processes happening in one, uh, in, in place order function, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's take this example. And, uh, you know, since there are multiple failure points, like the shipment order call may fail, fraud detection might fail or payment might fail or uh, even, you know, uh, the sending an email might fail. And not just failing, right? It's also about execution that is happening. It should happen exactly once. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's a, it's a problem. If you end up charging the customer twice, 
or I mean, sending an email is twice is not a huge problem, but it's still not a greatest customer experience. So <laughs> let's take example of this e-commerce application and uh, start explaining, you know, how would this durable uh, async await model would help me. This is actually a really, really fantastic uh, example because it shows um, an immediate uh, disconnect between the simplicity of the description, the specification, and the anticipated complexity of the implementation, right? Mm -hmm. So you were able, and of course, it's a simplified uh, e-commerce uh, workflow, but you were able to specify that uh, workflow fairly straightforward, right? We take a step, then we take another step, then we take another step. So, and um, that is is easy to explain, but I think we can all, like in our heads, already I imagine the dread when yeah. we have to implement that, right? And, um, well, where does, this, where does this dread even come from, right? So it's like, I think in our mind, we immediately jump to, um, uh, like, architecting a system where uh, okay, we need to we need to make a decision between are we going um, um, an orchestration route, are we going a choreography route? Um, will I have uh, databases? Will I have queues and databases? Will my database be the queue? Will I have uh, timers? Right? And um, okay, I probably have to design my code as a distributed state machine. Right? Events coming in, triggering the state machine, taking a next step. Oh, need to serialize some of that state and then uh, rehydrate some of that state later on when the event comes in. So, and immediately in our head, uh, that that complexity explodes. Right? That um, is is uh, is like an indication for the fact, right, that uh, we are addressing all of these problems on an application level, not on a platform level. Right? And uh, remember when we talked about async uh, await. Um, addressing concurrency on a platform level, right? I have sequentially looking code, but that is executed uh, concurrently. Now, you can argue that distributed async await uh, does uh, something similar. You have um, sequentially looking code that now gets executed in an, um, let's, uh, let's say, event-driven fashion. And uh, so in that sense, we are providing the same experience where you have a sequentially looking code that gets um, executed concurrently. We have a sequentially looking code that gets executed concurrently on a distributed system. Now, um, if you want to look specifically into, for example, how to uh, deal with uh, failures, that is where the partial failure comes in, right? So your system taking a step, and a step is often a uh, service call, right? And uh, service call is a call that uh, spans machines. Now, as soon as you uh, um, call a machine, or as soon as you span machines with a service call, you increase the uncertainty of your, uh, in, your, in your distributed systems. And that is actually a very, very, uh, very fundamental, but very difficult problem. So you have a caller and a callee, and in a distributed system, the caller cannot directly observe the callee. So when I send a request, right, I increase the uncertainty until a response comes back, and the response says, I did this or I didn't do this. So for example, let's say that uh, your workflow calls a credit card service, right? And then only after the credit card service says, I charged or I didn't charge, do you know what happened, right? And you can proceed according. Um, the problem here being what happens if you actually do not get a response or uh, in that time, or, uh, in that uh, context, often a, a 500 or um, um, request timed out uh, response. What does that mean? Was the customer charged or was the customer not charged? Just by looking at that situation, there is actually no way of knowing. It, you cannot distinguish between these two situations. And uh, so what is, our, what is our typical response to that? Our typical response to that is, well, we want it 
exactly one's processing, right? This shall happen or this shall not happen. But now we do not know. Therefore, we must retry. And uh, there is where um, two interesting observations uh, kick in uh, right away, or two interesting situations kick in right away. The first one is, it seems like things like retry or mechanics like retry seem to be fundamental to distributed systems where you have partial failure, right? The caller may, uh, um, uh, may still be alive while the, the, the callee crashed, right? And uh, so partial failure is a reality in distributed systems, one of the staples of addressing um, distributed systems uh, problems is retries. Right? And uh, so there is a possibility to put retry into the programming model. That is, for example, one of the features you get uh, by using uh, Resonate. Resonate will retry uh, service calls on a platform level, making them transparent on an application level. So you do not have to, uh, to consciously deal with the retry. However, uh, retries are also uh, tricky because you want exactly one semantics, but due to the retry, you're uh, introducing at least once processing, right? So the retry is going to try and try and try and try again until it runs out of its retry budget. Therefore, potentially, you just charge the customer multiple times, right? That is obviously also not something you want to do. So um, there is a need for idempotence in distributed systems, right? So that um, uh, the experience or the state of the system is equivalent whether you call a service uh, once or you call a service n times, right? That is um, idempotence. Now, idempotence has to be addressed on an application level. Um, you cannot generically implement idempotence, right? So you see a duality, and uh, that is a reality of distributed systems where we can push a lot of the mechanics into the platform. That is what we're doing at Resonate. We push a lot of the mechanics into the platform. But the fact that it is a distributed system um, uh, presents a certain reality that we cannot just make go away, right? Therefore, your code still needs to be uh, idempotent in order to yield a correct system. And uh, there, there is uh, one paper that I highly, highly recommend. It's one of my favorite papers, a note on um, uh, distributed computing. And um, that paper is from the early 90s. I believe it's from either 1992 or 1994. And the authors already lamented in 1992. And they already lamented that um, the the... Uh, we are continuously trying to pretend that a distributed system is not, in fact, a distributed system. Right? But they argue that distributed systems are inherently different from distributed uh, from non-distributed uh, systems, and we will not find an abstraction that uh, will give us the illusion that a distributed system is a non-distributed system. So. Um, at uh, Resonate, we embrace the fact that distributed systems are distributed systems. I believe it is, it is a futile effort if you try to pretend uh, otherwise. So we are embracing the fact and um, we are addressing the, the requirements together with the community, right? So at Resonate, we can push certain mechanics and certain guarantees. There are guarantees that we can push into the platform level, but we all need to uh, come together to also develop um, tangible, practical patterns that we put in place so that it actually yields uh, correct distributed systems. Okay. Um, that makes sense. And, you know, I'm going to add the link to the book that you uh, recommended uh, so our viewers can take a look. Um, for, from the point of view of a developer, right? So you mentioned some very great points there, like 
you know, taking away uh, the the understanding that the system is distributed from the application to the platform, right? What what does the platform mean here? If if uh, you know, just to add more clarity there. So when you say platform, mm-hmm. is it uh, the infrastructure that we are using? Uh, what exactly is the platform, or anything that is non-application is a platform? That's that's actually fantastic. Uh, that's a fantastic question, and you already had a fantastic answer. And uh, so uh, I like to think on uh, two different levels, on the application level and the platform level. And the platform level is basically everything you find right under the application level. But the platform, uh, depending on what you're using, may uh, simply be a library. So the question is basically, what is visible in your application code? Right? So let's say I have um, uh, retries sprinkled all over the code, right? Then that is clearly visible on an application level. If uh, the uh, the retries are invisible, right? Then the uh, retries uh, happen on a platform level. But that could mean that it's simply a library, right? Mm-hmm. That uh, implements um, implements uh, the retries. Is there some leaking? Probably. There may always be some leaking. For example, the simplest, the most simple example you can find is that um, you may be able at the startup of your application to set uh, the retry parameters, right? So what is, for example, the exponential backup? What is the, the default um, retry budget? But uh, you may need to override that uh, at, at uh, certain points for certain services. So in that case, right, instead of having the imperative code that makes the retry happen, you will probably see something more declarative, just a configuration on your service call that specifies some of the retry. But of course, you could argue, well, now it leaks into the application level. That is correct. But the majority of that uh, um, mechanic, of realizing that mechanic, still happens outside of your application logic, of your application code. And that is what I generally call the platform. It does not at all have to be a large piece of infrastructure. Uh, It can be a simple library. And that is actually uh, one of the, or that is actually the the adoption path that at Resonate we, we, we present. You can start off using Resonate simply as a library without any need for any infrastructure component. And then you get, um, uh, you get certain mechanics that are very popular in distributed systems, uh, like uh, retries, rate limiting, cancellation, timeouts, metrics, and um, distributed tracing um, on a platform level, even though that the platform in this deployment is nothing but a Resonate library. Sounds good. Uh, on the on the point that you mentioned on the you know the leakage of abstraction, right? Like, I I don't think like a developer uh, has to pretend that okay, I'm using a non-distributed system, right? That's not the goal. I think the goal is to minimize the effort that is you know required to make it all work. And as much as it is baked into the platform, I think it's it's best because I truly believe like code is a liability. And the less code you write, the less you maintain, and the you know less effort it takes. So uh, I totally agree. Like for example, using a library that gives you basic retries and you know uh, exponential back off and maybe basic rate limiting on the client level. I think that's that's a that's a, a good thing to have because as a developer, I don't have to think and you know leak that platform level abstraction or platform level logic into my application, right? I don't have to necessarily uh, think about it. Of course, I have to configure the retries because at the end, it's my system. I don't want to bombard the downstream. I don't want to retry forever. I have to make those decisions, but these are less decisions as compared to writing the entire retry logic. That's the point, right? I, I, I love that articulation. It's, it's exactly right. It's, it's near and dear to my heart. We are not trying to pretend uh, that this is not a distributed system, right? We want to make distributed uh, system development dead simple. 
But that does not translate into pretending that distributed systems are non-distributed systems. Mm. So uh, that articulation was fantastic. It's like, I totally going to steal that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, cool. So I, I guess my understanding uh, aligns with, you know, what you explained. So I'm really happy uh, with that. Uh, let's talk a little bit more on the partial failures and how something like Resonate uh, would help me deal with partial failures. So going back to my example of e-commerce, right? Like, I don't know, payment. Mm -hmm. uh, so fraud check, okay, no fraud. The, the user is fine. Uh, the order is fine. Uh, and then I have to make a payment. Um, and what happens if this payment fails? Mm -hmm. What what? How does this uh, durable async await programming model helps me as a developer? Mm -hmm. So for uh, for the uh, for the payment failure, right, or for uh, basically the the a failure of the coli, what we have to guarantee. Uh, in order to uh, guarantee correctness is that we will retry. We have to guarantee that, right? And um, of course, as we already mentioned, the developer has to guarantee that uh, the functionality is idempotent. But we have to guarantee that we will retry. And that is the basic guarantee that uh, Resonate uh, will uh, give you. So if the core fails, right, the retry is fairly straightforward. It's a very tight uh, retry loop since the caller, right, the process of the caller still exists. So we're, uh, it's a very, very tight uh, retry loop. However, what happens if uh, the caller fails? So uh, now you're basically kicking the can down the road. So that is something that uh, we need to be able to guarantee. And that is uh, where Resonate uh, um, kicks in with uh, um, the uh, uh, durable promise server. So we need to be able to capture the uh, state. So first of, the, uh, first of all, we need to be able to capture the intent that this um, uh, this uh, process shall be executed, right? So that if the uh, if the server uh, crashes or the caller crashes at any point in time, there is enough information for the system to resurrect the caller, either at that uh, particular node or a different node to resurrect the caller, and then resume with calling the uh, the callee calling the payment uh, service that is the tricky part so the tight retry loop right that can be simply uh, that can be addressed with a uh, library a stateless library no problem if you need um stronger guarantees you need an infrastructure component that is the resonate durable promise server that is able to capture enough state so that even if the caller crashes, the caller can be uh, resurrected and rehydrated so that it can resume from the point where it left off. That makes sense. And uh, just to validate my understanding, so uh, as, a, as a caller, uh, let's say I'm a simple, you know, stateless, stateless caller. I just get an API call and I make another API call uh, with, to make payments, for example, right? Mm -hmm and uh, my machine dies. Uh, so I have already made the call, but the state that, okay, what happened to that call? I've lost it because my machine is dead. Mm -hmm. So when I bring back another machine or another caller takes up this, this uh, API call, mm -hmm. uh, when you said that you have to, you know, kind of uh, maintain that state on, on some server, uh, to make sure that you don't end up making duplicate calls. Who decides that? And, you know, how is that decided? I believe it's based on some kind of uh, idempotency ID, for example, that, okay, this is something I've already done. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is, mm -hmm. is my understanding correct? There, Yes, your understanding is correct. So if we look at, uh, at uh, uh, either uh, async await or also uh, object-oriented system, right? So it's like, 
a function execution or a promise or an object. They all have an identity. Yeah. But they're typically scoped to the process where they are running in, right? Yes. And uh, as soon as uh, the process crashes, as soon as the process or terminates, um, these executions, they simply vanish, right? They go away. Uh, for, a, for a distributed system that must be able to um, survive uh, um, crash failure, that is not enough, right? Therefore, what the durable promise server does, first and foremost, is that it gives identity to uh, executions and uh, promises that is not bound to one uh, process. That's why I also like to call that the um, execution runtime separation, right? So now an execution or a promise has the capability to outlive a particular runtime and therefore uh, um, also a transition between runtimes. And that sounds like, whoa, right? So that, that sounds a little bit uh, like alien. But um, again, that is actually something that we are already... Uh, doing uh, sim uh, or uh, similar, similar concepts we were already doing in, for example, async await. In async await, we have one function execution, right? So there's one function execution. When the function execution awaits on a promise, the function execution itself blocks. It will not take another step. But we are often calling our systems non-blocking, right? Especially when they use async await, saying they can make progress. What happens is that the execution, the async execution, uh, is uh, detached from the executing thread, right? And that thread is able to pick up another execution that is currently runnable uh, and uh, taking uh, that execution forward, right? Until that execution blocks. And eventually that thread will come back and pick up uh, your async execution again. So if you look at async await, we're doing something similar but on a function execution thread level, right? Uh, we were able to detach that function execution from that thread until later on when we can make progress, when we attach that function execution to the thread again. Right? We're doing something similar, but on a machine level. So conceptually, you can argue that we detach. We are able to detach an execution from a particular machine and then um, um, uh, 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 make progress on a different machine. So an execution outlives the, the machine. That is the conceptual model. Right? And uh, the way to make this uh, reality is, um, is, is long, uh, long painted by, for example, database uh, uh, systems. Right? If you look at databases, they can absolutely deal with, uh, with uh, crash faults they have the uh, they 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 have it down rollbacks roll forwards right they know the um, they have it down the the guarantees your your system and your data objects need to be able to make right and the mechanics of using journals or writer headlocks in order to actually uh, uh, meet these guarantees another fantastic paper that's uh, highly recommended is from 1980. Uh, from Jim Gray, one of the uh, OGs, the original against us in, in um, transaction processing. One of my, uh, another favorite, such a clear mental model, a clear description uh, of uh, transaction processing. It's called a, um, a transaction model and uh, also highly, highly recommended. Uh, it, paints, it paints a very uh, clear uh, picture, a very clear mental model of what you need to do, right, on a platform level to provide these application level guarantees. So we took a lot of inspiration from that as well uh, in order to make this, this promise a reality. Interesting. Uh, that makes sense. Talking a bit more on, you know, the, the usability or the experience uh, for, from the developer side. So let's say I'm using Resonate for durable uh, promises. Um, how do I take the first step? Like, how do I set up everything uh, mm -hmm. so I can, you know, integrate durable promises into my workflow and what kind of apps, abstractions I'm dealing with and what kind of, uh, you know, settings I have to make sure I know to make it all work. Mm -hmm. 
So what was very important for me, very, very important is, um, it's like a very, very low, um, barrier, a very low mental barrier. I, um, because you know, I am myself, I am, uh, it's, we all get quickly overwhelmed with complexity, right? And it's like complexity, uh, breeds uncertainty and uncertainty is like one of the worst feelings. And I never more happy, like more confident than when I truly understand something. So it was very important for me that um, the, the, the starting point, it's just a solid like abstraction, solid model that is just understandable. Right? Where it's like, I understand this thing from top to bottom. So that was one of the reasons why we said, let's go async await, right? Functions and promises, because it is a, it is in itself a very small model, it is in itself understandable. And uh, I, I want to carry forward that simplicity. So uh, Resonate has an incremental path uh, to adoption, right? So it's like only introduce the, the uh, complexity into your system, as much complexity as you need into your system. So if you want to get started, today we have a, we have a TypeScript JavaScript uh, SDK. We are working on some other SDKs, but TypeScript JavaScript SDK. If you want to get started, all you need to do is npm install resonate the end. Right? So um, uh, there is no infrastructure uh, to set up. There's like there's no workers to host. It's like I want to meet you where you are because that is how that is my ideal experience. That is how I enjoy um, uh, developing and also learning uh, new technologies. So with that, if you do NPM install Resonate, you get out of the box, you get retries, you get um, rate limiting, you get cancellation, you get uh, timeouts, you get uh, distributed tracing and um, metrics. So um, but, uh, so this is all on a, on a platform level. So this is, this is transparent and you're only dealing JavaScript functions and JavaScript, uh, promises. Um, so, but now if you want, uh, the durability aspect, you want recoverability, you want to be able to withstand the fact that uh, your process crashes, right? Well, now we need persistence because otherwise uh, we basically, uh, quote unquote, do not know where we are, right? So now we need persistence. So for that, uh, then you have to deploy a durable promise server. So for example, the Resonate Durable Promise Server. Uh, the Resonate Durable Promise Server is a single binary, Right. So this, this was another uh, just important uh, for us. If you want to get started, it comes without any dependencies. Right? It's a single binary. You drop it, you start it, the end. Now you can connect your application, um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the application that you previously built uh, with a Resonate library. Now you can connect that to the uh, um, durable promise store. No, no other like modification needed. Now the, uh, the, your application has the possibility to recover, right? Because now we capture enough state so that even if your process crashes, we know where you were, right? We can, we can, we can bring this back up. So now we have an actual path to recovery. And, um, uh, we are still talking about a single process. So though right now we're not talking about fan out. So if you now say, well, uh, now I want to run hundreds, thousands, tens, thousands of computationally intensive tasks, um, then uh, you take yet another step and you venture in the concept of workers, right? Where the uh, durable promise is not only uh, um, an, an object for uh, coordinating locally, but it's an object for coordinating remotely, right? So now you can actually coordinate many, many different processes into one coherent system. But of course, with each and every step, right, you have to learn 
a bit more. So now we need to talk workers. So, and of course you also have to do more now, instead of just like hosting your, your one app process, now you have workers, you need to host multiple processes, right? But it's very important for me that uh, you only deal with the complexity if you need it, none of the upfront costs. So very, very incremental path uh, to adoption with a, um, with a, with a mental model that is based on very well understood and well liked abstractions, functions and promises. Interesting. Uh, this makes sense. Uh, so I have to think incrementally, like I can of course use a library first. I get all the retries, uh, you know, timeouts, cancellations, rate limiting, um, at the platform level. And so when, when we say rate limiting, these are just, uh, you know, at the platform level. And these are not, you know, uh, let's say, uh, business logic oriented rate limiting, right? Like, let's say I, I want to rate limit uh, based on the tier of the customer or something like that, like based on the, mm -hmm. uh, so it's not that kind of rate limiting, mm -hmm. but it's at mm -hmm. the platform level. And that's the abstraction, Correct. right? For, Correct. For, Correct. Okay, makes sense. Uh, and then once I want to extend and I want durable promises, I can host a server. Where is this server exactly running? Is it along uh, side my application? Uh, where does this st uh, state gets persisted? Uh, do I have to think about that? So um, that is a that is another uh, uh, interesting aspect of uh, Resonate. So uh, first off, yes, it is a server, and in um, in development mode, um, the server comes with, with uh, um, an SQLite uh, persistence uh, backend that I, I would um, see a lot of uh, people use in development, but a lot of people are not okay with that in production, right? So therefore, if you want to host a production uh, system, then you would probably use uh, the alternative um, uh, persistence, and that is Postgres. So um, then you would host the uh, uh, um, binary, the, the Resonate binary, and uh, the Postgres database. And of course, in the long run for Resonate, uh, we are also planning on having a SaaS offering so that uh, you have, a, you have a, a durable promise server as a service. So then you just have a URL and you don't have to worry about it. But, um, there is there is a different aspect to this as well, and that is like I do not want uh, resonate or the the broader concept of distributed async await and durable promises. I do not want this to be a walled garden. I do not want this to be um, like you have to commit to this one platform, right? Or you have to commit to this one service. I did not want that. So. First off, it always, I, I, it, 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 let's just sloppily say it rubs me wrong. If you have a distributed system, but this need for this very centralized component, that is, that is uh, uh, somewhat, let's call it a little weird. Yeah. So this very centralized component. So Resonate as a, as, a, uh, as a concept, as a platform, is meant to be a distributed, uh, but uh, be also decentralized. So there is no, there is no single uh, point that you have to commit to. So first off, the, um, uh, we try not to release everything itself as open source, but also the, uh, the, the, the concept and standards. So we have a durable promise standard that is uh, the concept and the binding as uh, REST. So we have the uh, open API. There is a gRPC specification. So, and that is um, Apache license. We don't, we don't own anything uh, of that. So it's like, whoever wants to implement that is like, can implement that, right? And then the Resonate uh, uh, distributed async await will just work with that, uh, with that uh, server, right? So it's completely uh, alternative uh, implementation. And you can have more than, more than one, more than one uh, server. But then you may ask, okay, why do I want more than one server? And that is something that is really, really cool. So I'm super excited about. And that is that, um, so functions are a universal 
um, uh, uh, abstraction for execution, right? Promises are a universal abstraction for coordination. So you have a downstream um, execution, right? And that creates a promise and awaits the promise. And then you have an upstream execution and that completes the promise, right? It works and works and works until the promise is completed. And then the downstream execution can take the next step. Now, since we're already in a distributed system and we're already doing this across machines, it's not only an abstraction for um, uh, uh, coordination, it's also an abstraction for uh, integration. So um, you can expose uh, whatever process that has a beginning and an end um, as a durable promise, and then the downstream can await on that. So I have a, I have a very simple uh, but a very cool demo that I personally really like. And that is, uh, I implemented a, um, you can say a durable promise server proxy, the stateless proxy in front of Apache Airflow. So now each and every Airflow workflow is exposed as a durable promise. So in my JavaScript, in my downstream JavaScript application, I can say await, right? And then the, the durable promise that is backed by an Apache workflow. So I say uh, uh, Apache Airflow workflow, await this workflow. And then seamlessly, right? The JavaScript uh, part doesn't even know that it's like that this is fulfilled by something like a completely different tech stack on a completely different machine, completely different cluster. It just seamlessly awaits until that workflow is done either like uh, minutes, hours, or days, seamlessly awaits until that workflow is done. And when it is done, it just takes the next step with the result of that workflow. So uh, that is like one of my absolute favorite demos. I haven't published it yet, um, but uh, that is uh, it's like high on my to-do list because I am just so happy seeing how uh, the durable promises are not only a means of coordination, but also a means of integration. And that's why it's so important for me that this is all based on open standards so uh, that nobody like, needs to commit to a certain like, technology right? or to a certain platform. This is open for anybody to use who's interested. If you, for example, develop your own SDK, it's not resonate specific. You can use it for anything you want that implements the, the, the open standard. And the standard, it's a promise. The standard is really, really small. It's four calls. Create, cancel if I don't need it anymore. Resolve and reject, the end. And there is, there is not a lot to a promise because a promise is only a representation of a future value. So it's very small, it's very easy to implement. It's a universal abstraction for coordination and integration. Interesting. Uh, and that's a very interesting point. You know, it's not about coordination, not only about coordination, but also about integration. So I can integrate different pieces of software together with the same programming model of async await, which is pretty cool. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I have a question there though. So let's say there's a workflow. So I, I'm taking an example. Let's say it's a purely asynchronous workflow. Uh, let's say there's a, there's a Kafka processing happening and you know, that I'm, ex uh, I'm exposing as a, uh, durable promise, for example. And after that Kafka processing or event processing happens, I change some state and, you know, say that, okay, it is done. Uh, and that may take like hours, right? So what happens to the, to the client? If, if let's say the client machine dies, what happens to the, you know, the delivery of the promise that, oh, this is done. Where is it exactly delivered? Is it? So uh, the promise itself, is uh, delivered at the, or the, the, the fact that the promise is resolved or rejected is recorded at the server, right? So it's persistently recorded at the server. So in that case, the server is the means for, for coordination and uh, integration. On the, on the client side, that is what we uh, generally, if the, if, the, if the process crashes, right, what we generally call the uh, recovery path. So um, on the client side, if the, if the process uh, uh, crashes, um, when it comes back up, it will basically just catch up to where you left off. 
However, of course, I mean, eventually you have to bring up that process, right? We don't own, yeah. we don't own the process. So if you never bring up that process, the system is never going to make another step, right? Okay. But if you, once you bring the process back up, that, uh, the, it will just take the next step on the, uh, uh, on the past the promise. Interesting. That is very cool. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a continuation of my caller function, right? Like where it left off. Yes. If I'm able to bring it back, it just continues performing the rest of the operation. And this yes. is again taken care of by Resonate. I just have to bring up my client. The state of the, the caller itself is in Resonate, right? Uh, yes, yes, that, okay. is, uh, that is correct. Mm -hmm. okay. For that, Perfect. again, you have, to use, uh, you have to use the server, right? So if yeah. you only yeah. use uh, Resonate as a, as, a, as a library, you cannot do that because then we don't have, we don't have the memory. Basically. That's right. But if you have the server, then this is exactly what happens. Interesting. Yeah. So there's, there's no state, there's no durability. So I can't expect my caller to just die. And, you know, so that makes sense. I need a server for that. Um, and uh, so there is interesting use case. I'm not sure if it makes sense, but I'll still ask. Um, so sending emails, right? Mm -hmm. Sending emails has, you know, okay, there is one step where you just send an email, but there's, you know, once an email is sent, there is a ton of things that are happening. And let's say I want to run analytics on top of it. So I just, uh, on my caller side, I say, send this email. And then it gets a promise back. Once that email is sent, it is resolved. But then there are multiple steps to it. So it's like multi-stage, uh, you know, promise delivery, for example, where it says, okay, the email was delivered. Now the email was opened. Now the email was read. Now there is a link which was clicked. So there are like sub uh, steps or sub tasks that are done. So it's like a multi-stage promise delivery. Uh, can I model this workflow as well in, in this durable async await format? Uh, you can. However, there's like, let's, so we need to draw one line in the, in the sand. And that is that a promise is a write once register. Okay. So as soon as uh, the promise is either resolved or rejected, so as soon as the promise is completed, it will never change its value again. So that is something that we need to uh, we need to work with, right? Okay. So there is no um, there is no incremental um, resolution. Let's say resolution. There's no yeah. incremental resolution. Uh, however, so of course, there's first off, uh, you can uh, um, represent the individual steps as individual promises, right? That, that uh, uh, you can do. Yeah. However, there is also promise combinators, right? And that is also very common. So for example, in, in the JavaScript or TypeScript or anything that has promises, futures or delayed values, however they are called, and that is wait for all, right? Or wait for one out of. So this is like promise combinators. Right? Okay. So in that case, uh, if you are interested in a, in a, in a, in a complete, um, uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a complete uh, resolution, you can also use uh, um, promise combinators where you uh, combine uh, multiple promises, you say, uh, this promise reflects this one, this one, and this one. And all of them need to resolve successfully. And then I am resolved successfully. So that is basically, once again, we used, uh, we, we took a lot of inspiration from um, what, whatever exists. Right? And uh, the, the promise combinators are very common and and or most common. And um, uh, we use that as like to meet you with your mental model where you are, right? And uh, so at least that's where I am, right? So this is where my head is at. And uh, when I deal with promises, I have promise combinators. So that is also on the roadmap. We, do, we did not implement that yet, though. So. But the promise combinators, I also expect them to go into the standard itself. Yeah. So it, there's a different uh, possibility of modeling that kind of uh, behavior. I was thinking, so basically a promise or a durable promise will only resolve to a value and not to another 
partial promise, right? Like a partial function. It has to be a value. Okay, interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the observability part, right? Like as a developer, when I'm dealing with distributed systems, making tons of calls and, you know, uh, things are failing, uh, what kind of telemetry is, you know, exposed by Resonate? Like, you know what, I, I made this call, but it failed twice and it, it succeeded in third retry, for example. Uh, how do I, is that also abstracted away from the developer mm -hmm. or how does that work? So um, one of the features that uh, I like uh, the uh, most is uh, distributed tracing. Now, distributed tracing gives you an insight into basically caller callee relationships and uh, how they uh, how they uh, line up uh, on on uh, physical time, right? So it's like what happens, when does it happen, and so uh, that is something that we 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 brought into the uh, into the into the uh, system uh, very early on. So if you look at async await, as it is a uh, it's very very interesting uh, abstraction, and you can look at async await from the uh, the uh, the point of view of when you when you a create. Right when you create, uh, when a caller calls the callee, so you you create another task. Right? You can think of that as one delineation, where you have this relationship: caller, callee. The caller creates the callee. Right, that's one delineation, one relationship. The other relationship is an await relationship, when a caller uh, awaits uh, a callee. Right, so that's yet another delineation, and um, our systems basically move forward from this span, from delineation to delineation, right? And um, it is uh, fairly tricky to keep uh, track of all of that on an application level. So first of all, it's super noisy, right? You have to put your app like the the tracing code everywhere. And uh, you also have to make sure that you 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 put it at the at the at the right points, right? So a try catch block, don't forget, yeah, you know, like because otherwise your your distributed tracing is all messed up. So um, in Resonate, that information is actually available on a platform level, right? So um, and that gave us a chance to weave in uh, guaranteed correct distributed tracing. So. Now we have this tracing uh, relationship. We can visualize um, also locally, just locally, right? If, I, if you just use the Resonate library, we can visualize the um, the the trace of your of your application. This is an unmatched uh, uh, debuggability. The first time I saw this graph, I was absolutely floored. I was really floored. It's like that level of insight. And there you see it clear as day. Here is your distributed uh, promise. Here we tried to resolve it. Here is the exponential back off because it failed. Here we tried to resolve it again. And it, it's just there. Right? So the, the, basically the entire history, the, the anatomy of this execution is just there for you to look at and study. It is a very, very cool experience. And without a single line of custom source code, it's just there. Interesting. Uh, that makes sense. And I think, so as a, as a developer, uh, I got a simple model to work with, even if I'm working with distributed systems. I get the observability. I get uh, the, the ability to configure how the retries and, you know, all the other abstractions would work. But at the platform level, I don't have to deal with anything else. Um, what else can I configure? Um, uh, for example, uh, how long uh, the the durability of of any uh, promise would uh, last? Something like that. Do I have to take care of that as well? Like, how do I cancel uh, some of the you know durable promises? So uh, one of the core design decisions is that uh, each and every promise has to have a timeout. Okay. The timeouts are 
uh, what uh, uh, gives us the possibility to guarantee progress, right? Because as soon as the promise times out, the promise counts as rejected. Uh, nobody else, and it, since it's a write once register, nobody else will be able to uh, resolve that promise again. So therefore, we can push past that promise. Since the promise is rejected, it will trigger your try catch block. But uh, there is a guarantee that you can always make a promise. So uh, depending on how you configure your promise server, so we, you can configure a maximum timeout. But if you decide not to, or if your maximum timeout is 30 years, then for all intents and purposes, right, you could argue I don't have a timeout. But uh, like from a formal uh, methods point of view, you always have a timeout. So you have a guarantee that this particular promise, if something awaits on that promise, it will not block your, your, um, your execution forever. So we don't, run, we don't run into these situations where we uh, block or, or deadlock, right? And this timeout actually gives our, our, that grounds our entire application model, right? So it's like we can make a lot of guarantees around that. By the way, the durable promises, we spend a lot of time and effort, uh, including deterministic simulation testing and simulation testing uh, to uh, guarantee and verify that promises are linearizable. That means that no matter, like, no matter what happens, no matter how many race conditions there are in your system, can happen, right? So it's like, yeah. how many race conditions there are in your system? How many processes try? to resolve a promise. Once a promise is resolved, the promise will be resolved for that by nobody in your entire distributed system. Nobody, not a single process, not even for a split second, will ever be able to observe a different value. Right? So the promises are very, very strong, uh, give you very strong, I mean, linearizability guarantees, as strong as you get. Right? Yeah. So the promises uh, give you the, the highest guarantee so that there are absolutely zero surprises. Because in distributed system, you know, it's just like there are a lot of surprises all the time, right? So it's like we uh, make sure that we minimize that as much as we can. So the durable promise is uh, in itself a very, very strong abstraction, very strong guarantees. Awesome. Uh, based on our discussion my curiosity to you know discover more on uh, durability and durable promises is has re like increased a lot uh, i am interested in understanding what's in the future so what is what are the current challenges uh, that you are trying to solve in this space and you know what is coming up in the future so um we are very early on in the uh, journey um uh, I want to say we have uh, very positive uh, early indicators on the on the uh, soundness of uh, our abstraction. So uh, what we are currently working on is um, a um, let's say a a minimal yet complete uh, feature set, right? So that the uh, the first SDK, the, the uh, TypeScript uh, SDK, is uh, minimally uh, feature complete. We actually released today the uh, 0.01 alpha version of both uh, the server and the TypeScript SDK for uh, anybody to uh, try and uh, give uh, early feedback. And uh, from there on, uh, we want to grow this into a uh, rock uh, solid uh, solution that across um, so both from uh, from a single uh, a single um, machine deployment to a, a multi machine uh, deployment. So uh, we already implemented uh, schedules, a convenience function for uh, being able to run. Uh, processes or workflows on a schedule. Think cron job, right? Um, we are adding uh, multiple features uh, in terms of uh, distributed locking. Now, distributed locking has many, many different uh, um, uh, challenges, right? Uh, you must not rely on distributed locking for the correctness uh, of your system, but you can rely on distributed uh, locking to optimize your system. So we implement uh, distributed 
blocking uh, facility um, straight into the uh, Durable Promise server, as well as integration with um, uh, uh, multiple different technologies, like, for example, uh, the uh, queues and serverless, so that you can easily also span uh, into the serverless compute. So you just have a JavaScript function that awaits a promise, and that promise is fulfilled by a serverless platform, like AWS uh, Lambda functions or Azure functions, Google functions. And um, so here we are looking for a lot of features so that the, 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 uh, the uh, programming model itself translates into a, like a tangible, uh, uh, a tangible project, tangible technology. So you can uh, use it in your, in your uh, projects with the technology that you most likely already use. Pretty cool. Um, so since we talked about async await specifically, um, are you also going to, you know, bring in durable promises to some other uh, concurrency models apart from async await? Uh, that is uh, that is a, it's a very good question. It is uh, it is on my mind. There are uh, a lot of uh, different uh, programming models that are uh, very attractive in the in the distributed system space. So, for example, if you think about actors, right? So it's like uh, how does the actor model um, uh, what is a what is a coherent uh, uh, experience when we talk about actors and when we talk about processes, right? Um, or uh, let's think about um, go routines on channels. So it's a, it's a different programming model from functions and promises, right? Or from async await. Go routines and channels is inspired by communicating sequential processes, right? So then there is a good is there a, is there a coherent uh, experience that uh, you can get from combining um, uh, 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 go routines channels and uh, durable promises. But um, uh, of course, a lot of care has to be like taken, right? Because it's, like, it's really very important for me that you do not have to rewire your brain, right? So the, the idea is that uh, we, we take forward or you can take forward the abstractions that you already know, right? Not to rewire your brain, not to think about the, the problem fundamentally differently. So I don't want to turn Golang or Actus into something that they are not, right? Because then I think we miss the mark. So there are a lot of, um, uh, uh, there are way more questions than there are answers in, in that regard. Because uh, we are all used to functions and promises, but actors and promises, how does that look like? That is, uh, let's say, like less established, right? So uh, therefore, um, I definitely have an eye on it and I'd be super curious about like everybody who has opinions about it, but I am not as uh, like confident to say, oh, we got this, right? So it's like, that is that's a way more uh, like uh, research and exploring has to be. It, it has to be dead simple. Otherwise it's not going to work. Exactly. I, I like the dead, dead simple. simple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Um, Last question on, you know, before we end this amazing session, uh, who should not use durable promises? Who is it not for? Perfect. There is, it's not a good abstraction for streaming right? hmm. because uh, streaming, if you think of a stream as something that produces value continuously, right? Uh, then uh, uh, clearly, that is in conflict, in stark conflict with a durable promise that is a uh, write once register, right? We are mm. not continuously producing value. We are producing a value exactly once. Right? Now, can you have a stream of promises? Yes, that you can have. That's not the question, right? So, but a promise cannot reflect a stream. So um, that is where I would draw a line in the sand and say, it's like, if you're trying to use a promise to reflect a stream, so if you're trying to use a promise to um, basically produce multiple values, right, uh, in succession, this is not what this is. So that is where I would not go that far. I do not believe that that abstraction works well. Somebody may come and prove me wrong and say, you know what, this works so fantastic, but I don't believe in it. Yeah, so it's like, I believe that it is a representation of exactly one future value. Interesting. 
And that is another point I'm going to look at more uh, just to understand this model and, you know, the stream processing model even better. Uh, but in the interest of time, you know, we have to end this amazing discussion. I was, you know, I always want to, it always feels we are just getting started. But uh, I, I can't thank you enough for joining this session and, you know, uh, talking about uh, what you have been working on, about Resonate about uh, durable async await and you know the future plans that you have so thanks a lot again and um, for our viewers if you want to learn more about distributed systems do check out dominic's uh, tweet, twitter profile and you know also linkedin and uh, his book uh, thinking in distributed systems and um, if you like this episode please hit a like button and subscribe to the channel um, i hope dominic it was also uh, you know, all the questions made sense in that domain and uh, it was, you know, uh, a good discussion. Hey, thank you so much for having me. That was a fantastic conversation. Awesome.